Yay, I'm unmuted. Ajan, you got the, the same, uh, same, same uh, strength as the host. You can do whatever you want. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to do anything except be kind. <laughs> good evening, Ajahn Brahm. Good evening, Angie. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. <laughs> Excellent. So would you like the uh, questions to be read to you or would you just like to choose them yourself? I think what they did yesterday was they highlighted the ones which they wanted me to answer and I did my best to answer them. But Good. I know that yesterday I just carried on answering the questions. And so it is nice to be able to have a pause at maybe uh, 8.25, so the toilet break, and then we can come back again at 8.30 to do the last half hour. That sounds good. It's also a mental break. Yeah. It's like going with the flow, as I said, so you can flow in a toilet rather than where you are. I have the first question here. Is it okay to slowly fast to death one who's suffering from terminal illness and burdening caregivers? No. Slowly fast to death when one is suffering from terminal illness and burdening caregivers. You don't know what terminal illness is because sometimes we think we're terminally ill and I just know too many people are supposed to be terminally ill and they just get better and live a long life. There's one of my favorite monks, he passed away, I don't know how many years ago, but he was sick with terminal cancer in Sirirat Hospital just outside of Bangkok or the other side of the, the river to Bangkok, uh, being supported by His Majesty the King of Thailand. It was Ajahn Tate, a lovely monk, and the doctors you know, said there's nothing more we can do. You know, you're going to die in you know, a short time. And so he said, well, I might as well go back to my monastery and I can die there. It was about 20, 25 years later on he died. He's a wonderful monk. So if you are suffering from a terminal illness, just uh, enjoy your days. And make the best use of them. Fasting to death. I mean, if you fast, that's terminal, if you keep fasting. But just you know, enjoy, take whatever food you can, and uh, just uh, enjoy those last days, because you learn so much in the last days of your life. They're very uh, important days. So don't waste them and hurry them up by fasting to death. Just let nature take its course, and sometimes nature su surprises you. Sometimes the, you, know, you learn so much those last days, and sometimes they're not your last days after all. So the future is uncertain. So don't fast to death, especially don't fast to death over Christmas. I had a big lunch today, so that makes me feel very, very, uh, uh, what's the word? Embarrassed. <laughs> okay, anyway, next question. Dear Ajahn, our mum has been ill since November 2019. Besides caregiving and spending time with her, is there a particular chanting and meditation we can do for a mum? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, just don't know how ill she's been, but just give her lots of loving kindness and find out what chants she wants to do and teach her some meditation if she likes to meditate. Because even if you're ill, you can always meditate. I like telling that story that even when I was about three or four weeks with um, scrub typhus fever, and that's really a you know, it's the same as typhoid. They didn't know what it was. And you know, I just had absolutely no energy, just really, really sick for days and weeks. And, and then just I decided to meditate. You can meditate, even though you're sick and in the middle of a fever too. So learn how to do the meditation where there always the Empress three questions, where now is the most important time. And the thing right in front of you is the most important thing in the whole world. And be kind to it, care for it. To care and being in the moment and making, not trying to get rid of things, but being with them and learning from them. You can always do that even when you're ill. And sometimes that changes your illness quite a lot. The next one is, we've got just all new questions up. Here we go. No, it almost came up. Dear Ajahn, thanks for the wise and profound jokes. <laughs> But I think it's not good to be a B plus blood type at this point. I certainly don't want to be COVID plus. Ha ha ha. Yeah, that's C plus. 
but <laughs> but I must admit that during the COVID time, you know, I started, we had to go in lockdown for a few weeks over in uh, Perth, but only for a few weeks. And I really, really, really thought that'd be an excellent opportunity for me to flatten my curve around my tummy. <laughs> but of course, I didn't succeed. My curve is still there because people are always so kind. I thought I could actually you know, fast or eat less, but when people they risked everything to come and bring you food and lots of food and delicious food, you know, how can you just say no to that? So when people offer you food, sometimes that's an offering of love and kindness, and it's just not correct to refuse it. So that question about fasting to death, no, people who really care and love you. They just want to make sure they offer you something. So please accept it so they can show their love to you. Anyway, hi, Ajahn Brahm. How should we think about letting go of a miscarriage? Please enlighten us. Thank you. First of all, it's not your fault having a miscarriage. It's not anybody's fault having a miscarriage. Sometimes we have uh, quite a wrong view of thinking life should always be perfect. That you know, everything. These anomalies of life happen, the disappointments. So what I would do if ever you have a miscarriage, and this is and a real story, so I'm sure you've heard me say, before, of this couple, they happen to be a Thai couple, and she got pregnant with care. But in the three or four days uh, since the last ultrasound and the actual everything was perfect you know very nice well-formed little boy in days the baby had turned in the womb and cut off the blood supply in the umbilical cord so it was still born it was a miscarriage and so when it was actually born this was actually just you know, after it was born so it was not really a miscarriage but a stillbirth you might call it a miscarriage but they were just so disappointed can't seem close, so close to having their first kid. They were stillborn. And I remember that because I did the funeral service for this little baby, Charlie, and had my photograph taken with it. It managed to get into the family album. And afterwards, I never saw this, but when they uh, we were talking about something else, the two parents took a ballpoint pen and drew a line on the baby's heel. Because according to tradition, if you have a miscarriage or a come into your life, you will have another try, another go. And that's what happened to this couple. She was a healthy woman. It was just you know, one of those things which happens, a bit of a mistake, a very unfortunate mistake. And she got pregnant again. And this time she had really top care from the doctors because they didn't want a second miscarriage or stillbirth to happen. And that she gave birth to this, this wonderful girl. And <laughs> first of all, the, the baby's gender had changed. And I often notice that, that if something unfortunate happens like a miscarriage, it's no one's real fault, it's just unfortunate. Sometimes that because the kid doesn't really get into this life, they have another go. When they have another go, they have they always get an upgrade. <laughs> well, people like me to tell you that story because got an upgrade from being a boy to a girl. It was called Annie. And I always remember Annie when she was a young kid. She was always hanging out with the boys. She you know, really beat up the girls. She was really tough and a tomboy because she was a boy before. But anyway, she came back. Oh, I should. And you know you really sort of you know you really wanted to have that kid, and there's no real physical reason why you can't have children. Then get pregnant again, and see if that baby can come back again. Give... Do imagine. I used to imagine what it would be like if nothing ever existed when I was distressed. I could feel my way into great relief that way. 
But sadly, I can't do that anymore since adulthood is that a form of escapism. I mean, when you're a kid, if nothing ever exists, when you are distressed, ah, well, you know, things do exist. But one important thing which you did there, you used your imagination to look at things in a different way. So if ever you are distressed, see if in your perception to look at whatever is you know, hurting you or harming you as something positive in life. See its meaning, see its benefit. Which is you know, why I keep using, I don't know how many times each day I say the story of treading in the dog poo and just taking it home and just digging it under your mango tree. Instead of looking at dog poo, something really distressed or if nothing ever existed for that. It's seeing a bigger picture. For those difficult times of our life, see the bigger picture, we can see much more of life and it doesn't, it doesn't hurt so much. And we see the way out of it. I was just writing to somebody who was having a difficult time in their life that I still recall just living in UK and in the this time of the year, December, January, February, we go into the forest and the woods and all the trees, we look like they're dead. They had no leaves on them because they were deciduous trees. And so there was no birds in the sky and there's no rabbits and animals on the ground. And even the flowers were all dead because it was too cold to support life. All those animals were in their burrows hibernating and the, the trees were alive, but all you needed is to wait for the, the warm weather of you know, March, April to come. And then what looked like a dead land, like a, after a big war with lots of dead, So inspiring out of what looked like death, depression, grayness, no life at all, no beauty. All the trees burst out into green and blossoms, beautiful pink, white, yellow blossoms on the trees. And all the little animals are scurrying around in the grass, just enjoying themselves immensely. And the birds cartwheeling in the sky and life was just, where did that all come from? Because a month or two before it was like dead. Now it was alive again. Always remember that whenever things get very depressing and no things there's no hope, remember just underneath that life is just waiting for some warmth to actually start to re reemerge. It reemerges with such beautiful in life and color and energy, and you realize that depressing it, the even depressing stuff is anicho, it's impermanent. It's just the phases of life. And out of that emerges this wonderful springtime of hope and love and goodness in our world. And the two always go together. You can't have one without the other. And this is the beauty of living in such a land. Anyway, next question. How should you view marriage and having children after all this ultimately create attachment? Thank you. Now you're asking an expert on this. <laughs> I don't know why people ask a monk about marriage and having children. Well, you know, I haven't got married. I didn't have children. I mentioned this because there was one time that I was uh, giving a talk in, it was in Bangkok, and it was uh, on like healthcare and using meditation to get greater healthcare. And they asked me how old I was. And I said, I, you know, the age I was, and they couldn't believe it. Now, honestly, they thought I was much younger. And they said, how come you've got such beautiful, good skin and you look much younger? What's the secret of doing that? Is it meditation makes you have young looking skin and good energy? I said, no, because I, I, I have young looking skin because I've never been married. <laughs> and I got people laughing, which was, that's how you get young looking skin by laughing a lot. Depends because sometimes you can look at it one of two ways. Let's give attachment. If you're wise, you know, you give energy and life to your kids 
And then when they grow old, they will leave you anyway. They want to go and explore the world. They will argue with you because they have to be, have the same things. They cause you a lot of suffering, not just attachment. And then after a while, you let them go. You give birth to them. You train them. And then you let them go. Just I don't have children myself, but I have lots of disciples. And that's what so much time and energy. Teach them how to meditate about the importance of keeping precepts and being kind. And then off they go. And you wish them well. You them back. Job is to give to them and let them take their gifts to wherever they wish in the world. And that's a beautiful way of looking at things. So if you want to get married and have children, if you know how to do it well, you're making this beautiful world, a beautiful like life available. Making sort of people as person, they come into your families. So it means that you're making a very good channel for, for human beings to be born into this world and have a wonderful life, a good life. So there's a sense of giving, making, especially if you're a Buddhist or something and good person, you're opening up the opportunities for human life to many beings who would not get that opportunity otherwise. Okay, next question. Many Buddhists seem to avoid alcoholic drinks. As Many see no harm in eating meat almost every day. Animals kill to eat their meat. The Buddha said you should never have an animal to eat their meat. But you know, sometimes it's a different thing than when you buy the meat in a supermarket or somewhere. You don't see the animals being killed. You don't do it yourself. Yes, you have some responsibility there but not the same responsibility as you're the one who has the knife or the, the gun killing an animal. And it's great that we avoid alcoholic drinks. I just was uh, reading recently, the local Australian uh, Broadcasting Corporation did some really lovely research about alcohol. It's just, it's actually poisonous. And there's nothing really much good Same if you can uh, give up eating meat, that's wonderful if you can do that. But some people can't. And you know, the vegetarian food is you know, not suitable for all types of people. And I always think that that's one of the reasons why when the Buddha's cousin, Devadatta, was also a monk, invited the Buddha, can we add some extra rules? That even monks, he said, make it a rule that monks can't eat meat. And the Buddha refused. He said, no, I'm not going to make that rule. And sometimes I wondered why. And it was because it makes it more possible for all types of people to actually to become monks and nuns and to be good Buddhists. Even if they cannot avoid eating meat. Anyway, hi, I jump on. What should I do when there's energy moving around my body? And my neck suddenly jerks forward, my shoulders jerk backwards, or it feels like energy is gathering and going to explode. It really depends on what time in the meditation these phenomena happen. And sometimes if it's moving around your body, just be kind to it. Don't get excited by it. And then uh, if your neck suddenly jerks forward and shoulders jerk backwards, if that is really unpleasant for you, if it's suddenly it's like a jerk and then you feel great afterwards, that's just a blockage often being removed. But if it feels like negative and painful, then that type of energy, that energy really builds up. Sometimes it builds up because it's the type of energy which should not be in the body, but which should be in the mind, which is one of the reasons is why when we meditate, I try to relax the body as much as possible, first of all. So there's not much 
uh, energy moving around the body. It just feels beautiful. It feels relaxed. Everything's at ease in the body. Then you can let the body go. And so I was saying this morning, then you can have your peace ometer relax your peace ometer. Then the energy doesn't start moving around your body at all. You know, it's just, and you don't go jerking around all over the place. Instead, you're just really inside and you're almost perfectly still. And it's amazing how easy it is to be still when you let the body go. It's just natural. And then when you go into the mind, you get you know, through the breath, you get the delightful breath, and you get to the nimittas. Those are very high energy states, but it's in the mind. And that's where the energy should be. Sometimes so we get that energy, which you know, should really be in the nimittas and the deeper meditations, and it's in the body. And that causes problems. It's good energy, but it's in the wrong place. So just go back into the way you meditate and see if you can relax the body first of all. And don't rush that part of the meditation. So the body is really relaxed. And so it can disappear. And then when you get these wonderful energies, they're in the mind, they can be incredibly strong. But they don't move you, they don't physically move your body. You just enjoy the high energy bliss in the deep meditations. Next question, is it recommended for meditation beginners to meditate while lying on a bed and try to be at ease and relaxing the whole body? Now you can try that, there's nothing wrong with meditating on the bed, but please do not meditate in the same position you go to sleep in. So when I meditate laying down, which I don't do that often these days, but sometimes I do, I always meditate laying on my back because I, I save that posture for meditation. But going to sleep, I either lay up my left side or my go to sleep. So when I lay on my back, it's like psychologically, my body is telling my mind, I don't want you to go to sleep now. This is meditation time. So I have a posture, which I just, a laying down posture, which I just use for meditation, not for sleeping. So my mind is clear what it, what it wants to do, what it needs to do. And I also often don't use a pillow when if I'm meditating on the ground. Again, so it means that it's not sleepy time. And so you can do that if you wish, and it's not a problem at all. But if you do meditate in the same position where you go to sleep in, you'll still start snoring, and that really disturbs other people. So see if you can find a posture where you don't go to sleep when you're meditating. Okay. Meditation experience with Ajahn Pamali started with really relaxing meditation. I felt peace and suddenly I do see a huge firework energy hitting hard towards me and shocking me. Can you please explain if, to me if this is a nimitta? I ask on celestial yesti. I don't know what the celestial yesti is, but anyway, quite likely it's a nimitta, but it was a bit too much for you and you didn't know how to deal with it. Hitting hard towards me and shocked me. Next time that happens, just allow that just to come in and don't, don't resist it at all. If you've got no resistance, it doesn't hit hard. But it just goes right inside and you enjoy it. You felt peace, relaxation, and then this suddenly happened. And maybe a bit too sudden and you didn't know how to allow it to come in. It would have given you lots of happiness and joy. So see what happens next time. It almost definitely is a limiter. I would say, and it's not dangerous. Just be soft towards it and it'll be soft towards you. Ajahn, I have heard a few times this morning the word which sounded like limiter. May I know what it is? It's not limiter, it's nimitta. Uh, N for um, Nolamara. No, what's a better word? N for never. Uh, e, sorry, that's wrong. N for never, I for Indonesia. M for Malaysia, I for Indonesia, T for cup of tea, another T for cup of tea, and A for Australia, Nimitta. And that is uh, the beautiful lights which arise in the mind at that time of meditation when the body starts to disappear. Bante, how can we differentiate between passion and loba? Well, right now, I'm really interested in developing business, but afraid of Loba at the same time. So this is, I am passionate 
about many things. I'm compassionate, dispassionate, and probably a few other passions around there. But it really depends. Passionate is really just putting a lot of energy into what you're doing, making it work. And sometimes there's no greed in it. You don't get anything. I don't get anything out of whatever I do. Just more headaches and more work. <laughs> it's supposed to be Christmas. It's supposed to be having. This is the first Christmas I've had in Body Now in a monastery for years. But it's no holiday because <laughs> I'm working very hard, but I'm enjoying what I'm doing. So you put passion into what you're doing. So if you're going to start a business, make sure it's a it's a, a right livelihood type business. In other words, it doesn't harm other people. It's not exploiting other people, or taking advantage over weak people. But it's something which is good and kind and uh, adds to uh, the services we can give to one another in this world. And then it's like a good business. And of course, to make the business happen, if you decide to do it, as Ajahn Chah always taught me, whatever you decide to do, give it everything you've got. If you're giving a talk, really give it everything. Don't give it like with half a mind and the other half a mind wanting it to finish. Just you know, give it everything. Put yourself totally into this. So if you're going to do a business, give it everything you've got and see if it works. But just make sure it's good. And that's positive. That's the right effort, right energy. And it's the right livelihood as well. So give it a go. Bhante, if jhana is the bliss of liberation and renunciation, isn't that the same as attachment to rupa jhana, which is one of the ten fetters? Yes, it is. But they say the jhanas aren't the bliss of liberation. The bliss of liberation is tasted in the jhana. This is the um, Sambodhi Sukha. So you have a taste of liberation there. It's not the liberation itself, because you have to and just totally let go, but it, it gives you a, an idea of what it feels like to be liberated. And attachment to the Rupa Jhana, which is one of the 10 fetters. Yeah, that's one of the 10 fetters. But that's the, the fetter which uh, non-returners have. And non-returners, you're that close to full enlightenment. And if you, uh, that's the only fetters you've got left at the end of this life, you get reborn as an anagami in the, the Sudawasa, the pure abodes. And there you'll just stay there and never come back to this world. You know, that's where you pass away. So it's, it is an attachment. It's a very small attachment. And there's a tiny thing which is left. And so as many monks which I know, they always used to say, don't worry about that one. That's not the attachments you should really be concerned about. It's the other ones like, you know, the, the coarse greed and ill will and wrong views. Those are the ones which are really... Uh, you should uh, work to eradicate. Namo Buddhaya Ajahn. Oh, from Indonesia. Namo Buddhaya. When, my med when meditation enters the happy breast, suddenly sees another life. Is this the nimitta? I don't know what you mean by another life. If you think that's you know, a, a history of your world, uh, maybe a previous life, I'm not quite sure. But it's just a nimitta. If you enter the delightful breath, the happy breath, then when the breath vanishes and the happiness remains, then that is certainly the nimitta. So the question isn't really clear enough for me to say exactly if it's a nimitta or not. But if it is a nimitta, that is when you're not watching the breath anymore, you've gone beyond the breath. And sometimes people always think in breath meditation, you should always be with the breath. And that's wrong. The breath is like the main vehicle you use. If ever I say travel to say Singapore, I go in an aircraft. But I've never actually landed the aircraft in the Buddhist fellowship in the Yeo's building. You know, you get out of the aircraft at the, in the airport and then you go by foot or by car, you know, to the Yeo's building. You change your vehicles as appropriate. And then when you get to the car park, you get out of the vehicle and you climb the stairs in your shoes. But before I get actually into the building, I even have to take my shoes off. So different vehicles for different parts of the journey. Aircraft to go overseas, cars to go from the airport to the center, shoes to go up the stairs, and then barefoot to go into the building. Different vehicles for different parts of the journey. Dear Ajahn Brahm, during meditation, observing coming and going of thoughts, feelings, just note 
not clinging, a sense of simple joy arises. Light within and coming out of meditation. What should I do next? Observe light or breath is light abnormal. As you are meditating, observing coming and going of thoughts, see if you can observe them totally going, not coming back for a while. And the feelings, just note, try not to note them. It's all right noting things at the beginning, but noting is noisy. And when you note, you try and sort of say it's a feeling or it's happiness or it's suffering or whatever it is. That is not really accurate. That's a, an approximation to the truth of these things. So see if you can do that at the beginning, which is classical vipassana. But then to go deeper, just to let those things go. And a simple joy arises. If I would encourage you to actually to allow the mind to focus on that joy without any noting and see if you can stabilize that joy so it doesn't come or go, it's just there. And light within, and if there's a beautiful light in there, allow that to really get very strong. And coming out of meditation, don't come out of meditation yet, enjoy the beautiful peace and the light because you're strengthening the mindfulness and you're getting more data. So when you do emerge, you'll have more data to work with to understand the Dhamma of the Buddha. And you have a mind which is far more powerful to understand what has been happening. Strong mindfulness, great data. Next question. How do morality, non-self keeping precepts help in meditation? Yeah. Is meditation an outcome of those? Or those qualities are an outcome of meditation. Can we still meditate without those qualities being developed within? <laughs> Thank you. But, uh, especially morality. When I started meditating, my morality was not that. It, was, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't sort of really perfect. It was through meditation. I got more sensitive. And that's where my precepts came stronger. You became so sensitive through meditation, you just you couldn't take alcohol. It made no sense to me. I just couldn't lie. How can you lie to your friends or lie to anyone? And I would never steal, but you know, sometimes I always remember on the London buses, if the if the the conductor never asked for the fare, I thought, well, why should I pay as a young man? But then I thought somebody has to pay for the buses. And it never felt right to me as you meditated more, to actually even cheat on, on the buses. So I always paid my fare. And even if it wasn't asked for, I'd always say, no, this is the fare. And I would always pay it to the bus, the bus conductor. So after a while, my meditation was what started strengthening my precepts. To the point that, that I remember going to the Thai temple I enjoyed going there because the Thai monks were quite happy in that temple, in Wat Buddha Padipa in London. And when I went there, I'd been going there for quite a while. And one of the monks took me aside and said, you've been coming here for a while. It's about time you took the five precepts. And quite honestly, I did not know what the five precepts were. So I asked the monk, what are the five precepts? And he taught me very quickly, not kidding. I didn't kill. I was a vegetarian then and not um, stealing, I said, I'll never steal. Not committing adultery. Did I have a girlfriend then? But if ever I had a girlfriend, only one at a time, couldn't afford anything more than that. So I would never commit adultery, just one relationship at a time. At a time. And then of course, no, it's a month, none. And then, and not lying, I said, no, I can't lie. I have to tell the truth. And lastly, not taking alcohol or drugs. Yeah, I gave them up a long time ago. And so, I found my five precepts even before I knew what they were. So being an arrogant young man, I was arrogant. And I told them, I said, I don't need to take the five precepts. I've been keeping them for quite a while already. So I never actually took them from that monk because I found them out myself through my meditation. And so, but the meditation helps the morality, but the morality also helps the meditation. Because what happens in morality, you're renouncing, you're letting go of this, you know, what I want, what I want to do, because it's going to harm and hurt others. And it is 
that letting go, which allows you to get into deep meditation. You're letting go of control. First of all, you let go of controlling sort of others for your own happiness, and you let go of controlling everything. And when you let go of control, that's when meditation really starts to happen. It's knowing that meditation requires what we call renunciation. And when we do renunciation, letting go, precepts are the easiest thing in the world. And so is meditation. Okay, next question. Dear Ajahn, I'm still... We don't have a brain, you know, in when we first take birth, we have a mind. It comes from our previous life. It's a stream of consciousness, said the Buddha. That's the mind. It goes into a body and the brain is not fully formed. It's not strong yet. And it does seem to be, you know, just from what I've seen, not really research, is it takes about six or seven years before the brain really takes over. The physical brain and that brain is very much conditioned by your um, your country of origin and your race and stuff like that a good example of that is one of our committee members uh you know she was sri lankan and her son when her son was born would insist on eating chinese food with chopsticks and what's going on you're sri lankan so Lankans don't use chopsticks, they use their fingers. But anyway, the child insisted on that for the first five or six years. You know, because it's obviously it was for, came from Singapore, Malaysia or somewhere. But then afterwards, they started eating like Sri Lankan food, the Sri Lankan way. So the first few years, we're very much conditioned, you know, just by our previous life. And sometimes we can remember details of that previous life. But after six or seven years, that all tends to disappear as our brain in this life takes over. And the same when we pass away, when the brain starts to stop working or gets diseases. And then the very end of your life, when the brain starts to not function anymore, for some people, the mind is still very strong. And this is what we call that, I've given talks about this before, the terminal lucidity. When people, when their brain is just basically dead, but they can open their eyes and talk to people. Their mind is very clear. People with Alzheimer's, they're not supposed to remember anything, but the last few moments of their life open their eyes. They can remember everybody. This is where the mind is taking over. The brain is shot, done, gone, finished. Then the mind has the opportunity to assert itself again. So the mind is something totally different from the brain. But it seems to be in this human life, the brain takes over for so many years of our life. But sometimes when you meditate, you can get access to your mind. And if you meditate and get access to the mind, not the brain, but the mind, that is when you can start remembering previous lives. The previous lives, memories are not stored in the brain. They're stored in the mind. So then you can actually remember where you came from. Next question, how to find our inner peace in a turbulent world? That sounds like a good title for a talk. <laughs> in a turbulent world, yeah, the world is sometimes turbulent. But only when you start thinking about it. You know, this is very unpleasant. And on one meal a day, appeared, and Ajahn Liam took over and said, we put the earth in the wrong place. Another three days of work. And then Ajahn... Wheelbarrows, you just sit under your huts all day drinking tea and talking to the visitors. And that's when one of the fellow monks saw me 
and they gave this beautiful, beautiful teaching, how to find peace in a turbulent monastery, <laughs> not on a turbulent world. And then what they said to me was, pushing the wheelbarrow is easy. Thinking about it is the difficult part. And I will always remember that saying, and that meant so much to me. If ever I could find that monk, I don't remember who said it to me, but I just got so much gratitude for that. The world is turbulent when you think about it. You don't think about it, living in the world is easy. Just push the wheelbarrow. Dear Ajahn, my father has become more negative as he's getting closer to the end of his life. How can I help him help him set more positive intentions so he can have a good rebirth? Thank you. I don't notice how to find the triggers to remember his beautiful past. Try and get some, some images or some memories of the good he's done in this world. It may be just little letters from the people he's employed or uh, his friends come around and just, it's, I don't know, he may, doesn't even need to be Christian, he's a Buddhist, go around and sing Merry Christmas to him, make him laugh, give him some sort of positive memory of his past. And once you start getting a little bit of positivity coming up, this is that first piece of positivity. Just like a story which I said in another retreat recently, that when I was in visiting prisons, I always told people this, you know, be more positive about your life. But I mean, you're a good person. No, I'm not. And I got them to have a piece of paper, their name on the top, a vertical line down the middle of that piece of paper on the left-hand side, right all so negative, why you're just a hopeless case. And I got them to write out, they filled out that left-hand side of the page so easy right at the margin and between the lines they didn't have enough space to write all the negative stuff about themselves and then the right hand side i asked them please now write something good about yourself and they refused there's nothing good about myself i'm a hopeless case i'm in prison so there must be something good about you no there's not because i knew the other prisoners i know this fellow he was one of the people who looked after the uh, one of the cats in the jail so you look after the cat you know, did you give the cat anything this morning to eat? He said, yeah, I gave it a source of milk. Put that down. <laughs> it's quite firm. The prisoner had to put down on the piece of paper on the right-hand side, one of the good things he did, give the cat a source of milk. And once I got him to do that first one, the second one was quite easy. And the third one was even easier. And he filled that right-hand part of the piece of paper. Once he'd just broken always looking at life in a negative way. And once he started to see just one piece of good things about it, he started to see another and another and another. And another. Just go and uh, photocopy it, laminate it or whatever, and keep it with you. To remind yourself you're not a bad person. find something just to make him see what in a different way. Next question. Dear Ajahn, I've been jobless for a few years. Same as me, I haven't had a job for 46 years. Can't call being a monk a job, can you? Well, I don't get paid for it. Anyway. I've been jobless for a few years. This situation makes me so stressful, full of worries and anxiety. How can I meditate when my mind is so anxious about the future? Oh, first of all, if you've been jobless for a few years and you're unemployable, come to Australia and become a monk. We're always taking on new staff because monks, nuns, are just wonderful beings and there's never enough of us in the world to serve. But anyway, if you've been jobless for a few years, you never give up because, you know, the economy comes up, goes down. You can get some more uh, education to enhance your skills, do different things. Don't always do the same thing. And then you can make yourself employable. And hopefully, if you join societies just like the Buddhist Fellowship 
or Bodhinyana Singapore, the Brahm Center, or the BGF, or AE Pasico, all these other wonderful organizations. You talk to people, they can find you a job. There's always no jobs to be had if you are really committed to them and you really want to make sure that you, know, you can actually give to that organization and you have something to give. And next question, and I don't know if these answers are any good. So if they're not so good, you can always ask a again or just say, Ajahn Brahm, that was the worst answer I ever had because it's very hard to offend me. Anyway, next question. Hi, Ajahn Brahm. Sometimes I don't know why, but I just feel so sad for no reason and empty with such void in myself. I feel very lost without any solutions and I'm frustrated because there isn't a clear way out of this. Please give your thoughts on this. You feel so sad for no reason. First of all, it's okay to feel sad for no reason. You feel you have to feel happy like everybody else. Because that was a story behind <laughs> the very first grumpy license I ever gave. There was a lady in one of my retreats in Perth who said almost exactly the same. So I always feel sad for no reason. And it really upsets me to see all these other people on your retreat smiling and looking happy. And I feel just so miserable and such a failure. What can I do? And it was one of the interviews which I was giving. So I said, just wait for a few moments. And I went, turned on my computer and just and I printed it out. This license is a license officially gives to you know, the lady, it was called Ronnie, her name was. She gives to Ronnie permission to feel sad for good reasons or for no reason whatsoever. I'm again for any reason. So I permission to feel sad. You know, she smiled and was laughing for the retreat. It worked. She felt miserable about being sad for feeling sad. If you want to feel sad, go for it. Feel sad. Be kind to the sadness. Let it be. Then you find it doesn't last that long. If you try to get rid of the sadness, then it lasts. You feel sad about being sad. When you're happy to be sad, it doesn't last. Next question, I find it difficult to do home retreat compared to meditation center. I have to multitask, I have to do multitasking like settle house chores and attend to your Dharma talk. I cannot settle down because my young kids will disturb me during meditation. Ah, oh, please advise. Yeah, I agree with you. It is much more difficult if you can, you know, go to somebody else's house, you know, for the talks and the questions. That's wonderful because it's I don't know if you can, though, because of COVID restrictions. But, you know, we're trying to do our best. I must admit, I've done a lot of these um, online retreats now, but there's nothing like in person where you can actually look at people and you get much more feedback from them as a teacher. But anyway, this is the best you can do in these situations. So you have to settle the house chores and uh, do whatever you can. And if you've got young kids, disturb me during meditation. There was this one lovely story of this uh, lady with young kids here in Perth, and she had a similar problem. Whenever she wanted to meditate at home, her young kids would just say, mommy, I need a glass of water. Mommy, I need to go to the toilet. And they never needed that. They needed attention. They didn't like the mommy doing something else where they couldn't sort of get access to her. So, one day, mummy decided, right, I am now going to meditate, and you kids will not be able to disturb me. So she got the water, made sure they'd been to the toilet beforehand. But still, as soon as she closed her eyes, mummy, mummy, I really need, need another glass of water. Mummy, I need to go toilet, please. And she just ignored them. She carried on meditating. And then they climbed over her and started pulling her hair. She had long hair. And she didn't move. And then she said she was so impressed about the innovation of her kids. 
Mummy, mummy. Mummy, mummy. Uh, Tony has got the knife out of the, the kitchen cabinet. I've got to be concerned. But then she says, Code. Kitchen knife. Or if they blow up the house by turning on the gas, so be it. I'm going to meditate. And so she called the bluff of her kids. And then opened her eyes. And the, the kids were in one piece. And the, the gas had not been turned on. The house was not blown up. And the two kids were sitting quietly in the corner playing together. And she realized that from that time on, she had won her ability to meditate in her house. The kids, they wanted attention. They weren't going to do anything that bad. And when she said, no, I needed my meditation time, the kids appreciated that. And of course, she was a much nicer mummy after her meditation. So sometimes you need just to do that, to sit down, give priority to your meditation because you really need it run over you or whatever and shout at you, but just don't move. You'll be training your kids. Okay. Feedback. Ajahn Bamadi Sutta classes have been the most heart-opening and warming, sincerely moved me to tears many times. Excellent. Feel like, felt like this path is worthwhile and easy to do. Is it due to heavy karma that one cries at Sutta Dhamma talk? Thanks, Ajahn. No, it's not just due to heavy karma. It's just sometimes you hear some talks, some explanations. And, it, and when you see beautiful things, it does. It just make you emotionally prone to tears. In Pali, it's called a particular type of pity of happiness, and it makes you just teary and sometimes even cry. So this is never suppress those tears. Let them come and enjoy them to the max. It means those Dhamma teachings are really reaching you. Okay, one more question and we have toilet break. Dear Adam, if we have thoughts of harming other living beings, will bring harm to ourselves. However, when I'm bitten by mosquitoes, it seems to be more harmful not to get rid of them in case of malaria. How to apply the Buddha's teaching? Indeed, I mean, quite frankly, that you know, if you are being bitten by mosquitoes or if you have, like, kids and you don't want them to get sort of uh, malaria or dengue fever, that's much more different. That's much different than killing animals just because you're a hunter or because you just don't like them. Or you. So first of all, it's much less karma. Still, you know, not the best thing to do, but much less karma if, you know, you are um, swatting a mosquito because it's about to bite you. But nevertheless, I don't know what country you're in, but most mosquitoes, they don't have malaria. Most mosquitoes don't have dengue. And the chance of you being bitten by one mosquito and getting malaria or dengue are very, very small. You can do the maths if you like. I don't know that maths anymore. Mosquito bite me. And just, it's only a small bit of blood and just, I wish you happiness and well-being. So they bit me and then just took the blood and just flew off and a nice little mother mosquito. I saw it with this big fat belly with my blood in it and it gave me, it was only a little itch which I had on my skin. And you let them fly off. It was like loving kindness. So if you're actually in a house, make sure you've got lots I'd make sure you wear the uh, perfect. So do the best you can. 
Okay, the next question, what is the purpose of life? How do I find it? The purpose of life is to go to the toilet and let go. And how do I find it? You can see the signs, uh, men, women, and that's what you can do. Because I did ask the time to have a toilet break. In a few moments, but now it's toilet break time. Because I have to keep my promises. Okay. Toilet breaks. Ajahn, are you going? No, because I've been sweating. It's still really hot here. Okay. You have to speak to some of the your, your followers. Okay, if they don't want to go toilet. Okay. I, I, I let Suwadi. them unmute themselves. Yeah, Sawadi, Sawadi. She's on my screen. Oh, she's an excellent follower. <laughs> we see her every time in Gunting. Yeah, it's always, I always say the usual suspects. <laughs> the two three is in. Oh, excellent. Where is he? What the hell? Oh, I can't see you, but anyway, I'll just scroll across to see if I can find you. Oh, there he is, yes. <laughs> You look the same as you always did. Ever since I met you, you haven't changed. <laughs> well, how many years have I known you now? 30 years? 35? Yeah. A long time anyway. It's nice to see you. A nice smile on your face. Where are you? Are you at home? You said he looked the same. He's just frozen. Ah, <laughs> oh, exactly. It's not a photograph. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, sometimes that I'm supposed to be a monk. But you know, sometimes it's nice to see you again. Just associated because this is my role as a Buddhist monk. It's your role as you know, looking after the BGF. And, and Angie's job is looking after the Bodhinyana Singapore and the Brahm centers. And oh, many of these people. Are you going to the toilet? Me? No, yeah. no, don't, don't go to the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> no, the reason is because and it's still really hot in Perth today. It was just, again, up to just under 40, 39 degrees, and it's still really hot. So when you're hot, you know, you just have to keep drinking. You don't go to the toilet very much. Because, uh, you know, Might just stand up and stretch. I don't know, I'm just happy sitting down here. I see that is Lady Linda London. Is that a, a nun? Looks like there's a, a, a nun. Oh, yes, hi. Hi, Ajahn Brown. Yep, yeah, it's me, a nun. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Great. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Excellent. Where are you living? Oh, Damadina. Singapore. Oh, excellent. Great. Nice to see you. How's Singapore treating you? Yeah, it's good. Uh, Miss Jana Grove. Oh, yeah. Well, Jana Grove is still there. Actually, they're having a retreat there for some of the um, Israelites having a retreat. And the person giving the retreat is giving it sort of online. So they have a big screen there and they're seeing the person give it online, like you're seeing me online. But China Grove is still really doing well. And now, actually, we're also starting to build a retreat center in the Melbourne Monastery, in Newbury Buddhist Monastery. So we're gonna have a second retreat center in Australia. And why not? There's plenty of people wanna go on retreats. And I'm, my factory over here, my monks factory and nuns factory, we're actually making lots of really good uh, monks and nuns who can teach the Dhamma, and just like Ajahn Brahmadi, make people cry. Because it's a beautiful Dhamma which is taught. And that just makes me really feel happy. And some of them are now giving better talks than I give. And that's part of my succession planning. When they start giving better talks than I do, then it's time for me to retire and enjoy my, my senior years in my cave doing nothing except sitting and eating. <laughs> I don't think I'd get away with that, but in my fantasies, I can dream about that. <laughs> There's no retirement for monks.
Thanks, Ajahn. We had uh, recently had Ajahn uh, Santuti and Ajahn Kemavaro from your, yeah. monk, from your monk factory. factory. Yeah. And how did they do? Very really well. Good. Yeah. yeah. They were fantastic. Ajahn, Ajahn Santuti, I'm just really amazed that now he's building this monastery just uh, in uh, Kelmscott. And he's doing a wonderful job there. And just people seeing him, he's just really happy, he just works really hard. And he's very easy to get on with. And when I ask him to pick, can you teach a Dhamma talk, then off he goes and teaches. And, you know, he's learned how to give Dhamma talks and learn how to teach meditation. And to see him, for remember him when he first came, just as this young, young Anagarika. And I always remember, I think uh, Angie and BGF remember this, that when unfortunately that you know, the cooks, you know, the Bianca, her partner had this really bad leukemia, so she had to cancel the last minute. And ah, who's going to cook for the retreat? And Santuti was an anagarica, and I got him to cook for everybody. And, and everybody yes. managed to go to the kitchen. They saw him with so many woks and so many ladles, and he was just so happy just cooking everything. And he made lovely foods as well. It was just so enjoyable just to watch him cook. A big smile yes. on his face. We had lovely yeah, Chinese that... food. We have lovely uh, Vietnamese food, lovely Chinese food, lovely Italian food. <laughs> yeah, that is great. And he's just, his attitude is just whatever he does, he puts a lot of fun into it. And so now he's become a good builder and a good teacher. That's that's our little path. Like Ajahn Bamali became a good builder, now a good teacher. So we build our own monasteries. It's very. <laughs> Very cost effective. <laughs> That's great when we do things like that. And it was that, very hard for me to hear uh, the monk, uh, Ajahn Santuti, who actually built Jana Grove for us, who benefited as a retreat in later years. It was really good. Oh, yeah. 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 The, he was. The hall. The, the hall. Yeah. hall. That's the, right. The, the, the wooden hall. Working just because we couldn't get a, a builder to finish it off, just in the, the flooring, bamboo floor. And then just uh, the following morning, we're having our grand opening ceremony <laughs> where we had the premier of West Australia coming. Ah, <laughs> and we didn't have it finished. Ah, and so he and quite a few of the other monks, including Ajahn Pamali, they worked until four, about four o'clock in the morning all night. Had about one hour, two hours sleep, and then we started our big opening ceremony the following morning. And they did such a magnificent job. And this, so if you really need a crisis, get the monks, and we'll <laughs> finish the job for you. <laughs> it was quite, quite a. It was beautiful. Anyway, we should go back to the questions again, I think now. Is everybody back from the toilet break? <laughs> okay. It's good to see you all anyway. And as many I haven't seen, which are down this summer, hi to you all. And I better go back to the questions. All right, well, the purpose of life and how to find it. And of course, the purpose of life is finding contentment. So when you find contentment, you find it every now and again in your life, moments in your life when you're perfectly content and at ease and peaceful. And that gives you again a lovely, wonderful idea of what it must be like to be enlightened. You don't need anything in the whole world. You don't want anything in the whole world. You find you have enough. And that beautiful contentment and peace leads to deep stillness and being able to care for everybody. You don't want anything. You're at peace, at ease. So you can give this beautiful sense of invitation into the present moment to everybody. That is your home now in peace. And it's big enough to invite all your friends and associates to come in. And that's and how you find it. Oh, you find it in so many different ways, but meditation is the best way to find contentment. To find out what do I want, what do I need? Not much. Anyway. <laughs> I've been having wonderful little uh, talks with Ajahn Bhamadi about the Kalama Sutta, only teasing him because the Kalama Sutta is a beautiful sutta. But as I said to you all yesterday, that the Kalama Sutta says you should not 
ancient texts and traditions. And I said, well, that's what the Kalama Sutta says, and that's an ancient text. So it's just uh, mutually, it's self-contradictory. But of course, that's only when you look at it logically. If you look at its meaning, the Kalama Sutta does ask you not just to believe things because they're traditions or they're texts, or because just the old ways of doing things. Do they really work for you today? So Kalama Sutta talks about confusion, delusion, leading to unskillful actions and bad karma. Does sloth and torpor, restless system and remorse, skeptical doubt through the five mental hindrances associated with delusion lead to bad karma? Uh, usually sloth and torpor doesn't lead to any bad karma because you're, just, you're inactive. The only time that sloth and torpor can lead to bad karma is if you're driving a car when you're half asleep. Now as a, a student, and he said that you know, he's not afraid of death, that he wants to die like his uncle who died in his sleep. Would you like to die in your sleep? But anyway, he said, I want to die in my sleep like my uncle, not screaming and shouting like all the passengers in the bus he was driving at the time. <laughs> okay, that's a funny thing. I don't know if it worked or not, but I've seen the wonderful nun is smiling. Which is... Anyway, uh, restlessness and remorse This one is just all over the place, which means that, you know, that sometimes one is not being responsible. And skeptical doubt, again, like restlessness and remorse, it means that sometimes that you're not clear enough to make really good decisions. So if you're in a position of restlessness and remorse, because people want some clarity, And sometimes people don't know what to do and which way to go. You know, who are in I get a tight fitting in my chest. That is a Allow the breath to come. And then when you focus on the breath, your chest is not tight. Ajahn, I tend to avoid my anxieties when meditating today, found a mixture of emotions gathered around my chest area. I was wondering how should I face and deal with it? Thank you. Oh, you may not expect this answer, but I would say avoid your anxieties even more. So when you're meditating today, Go past the emotions gather around your chest area. Just relax the chest area. Don't worry what the, the emotions are and go into the body being really, really relaxed. And then the mind getting relaxed. And when you come out of the meditation, your awareness is so much stronger. It can penetrate exactly what are those emotions? Why do they affect my chest? If you don't have like a powerful microscope, you can't see what's really happening. You can't see those COVID viruses which are causing so much trouble. You need very powerful equipment to be able to locate them and find out what they're doing. And that's most similarly for when you have strong mindfulness, you can look at things which are happening in your body, like the, the tightness in your chest and the emotions <laughs> causing that, and you can find out exactly what they are and deal with them appropriately. But we need to get that strong mindfulness, first of all, free from the hindrances. I'm gonna talk about that tomorrow, how to lessen the hindrances, so that your mindfulness is really strong and can focus and it doesn't have restlessness, it can stay there until it finds out what's actually happening. So avoid those anxieties for a little bit longer, go deep in meditation, or, you know, come out of meditation with a lot of power, and then you can look at those anxieties, you can understand them. Ajahn Brahm, I have killed numerous ants and other insects, does it mean I won't have a good rebirth? No, you should be fine. The thing is, if you get guilty about that, then you know you won't have a good rebirth. 
So sometimes, see if you can let go of that. I don't know why you killed the ants and stuff in the past, but sometimes maybe it was because you were very young, a young kid, you didn't really know what you were doing. But what else have you done in your life other than killing ants and other insects? I'm sure you've done many, many wonderful, beautiful things in your life. So why don't you focus on the good things you've done in your life? If you focus on the good things you've done in your life, especially as you're passing away, then those good things in your life, which are huge, will give you a wonderful rebirth. So a lot of times it depends on what you focus on and what you start thinking about are those last moments of your life. You have done lots of good karma. So focus on those and forgive. For you, it means to just, oh, I don't know. Mean to be a good son or daughter. Thank you so much for your teaching. I don't have a son. I don't have a daughter. So what does a good son or daughter mean? Whoa. What does it mean to be good? Uh, that was many, many years ago. I think it was a couple of Buddhists in the United States. And they had their first child. And they said, well, how can we bring up our, our child? They didn't want to be indoctrinated with Buddhism. But they didn't want to not teach their child about Buddhism because they found so much benefit in it themselves. And you know, should we let the child find out for themselves or should we train them? How much should we teach and how much would we train them? And the monk gave this beautiful answer. He said, just train your child, children into just two things and to be honest and to ask questions. Just those two things, honesty and investigation, question answering. I thought it was a very wonderful answer, which he made up on the spot. Because honesty is so important in life, because without honesty, how can you ever be good or find out the truth in life? Instead of what's true, you'll find out you know, what is convenient for you, or just you know what creates pleasure for you. There's no truth there at all. Can I? Ha okay, I'm, when I have these jokes come into my head, I can't help but tell you them. Here is this joke. Please, if I offend somebody, uh, I apologize, but it's a nice little joke. This was uh, the three uh, people. There was Superman and Snow White and Pinocchio. This was in Los Angeles, just outside of Hollywood. Snow White, Superman and Pinocchio were walking down the street and they saw this big sign which said, um, beauty contest. So Snow White said, oh, I'll have a go at that. People sound beautiful. So she went inside and five minutes later, she came out with the first prize, a lot of money, very happy. Yay, I won. And they walked a little bit further down the road and there was a big weightlifting contest. And Superman said, oh, I'll try that. And so Superman went in and he lifted up the weights and he won the first prize. He was Superman for goodness sake. He came out with a big smile on his face. And the third competition was the greatest liar competition. And so Pinocchio went in and five minutes later, he came out crying and sobbing. And he, he said to the others, he said, who is this Donald Trump fellow? <laughs> okay, a few people thought that funny. <laughs> I get into trouble with some of these jokes, but anyway. <laughs> So anyway, being up your son and daughter, be honest, it's really, really, really important. And to ask questions, which means then your children can find their own truth. If you want them to be a Buddhist, ask questions. If Buddhism is a good religion for them, they'll be honest about it. They won't stop until they find out a truth which satisfies them because of their honesty. So you're equipping them to discover their own path. Honesty and questioning. And they will not stop until they find something which is very truthful and satisfying for them. And it also the rest of their life, they are always questioning and honesty, which means that will be equipping them to be good children. And you'd be very proud of them. It takes a lot of work, but it's good for them. 
defined as sexual misconduct. Now, in the precepts, the sexual misconduct change the places where you're staying in. You know, of maturity for different age limit for for maturity but in spite of purposes that you're not exploiting your partner in other words you know if you're their teacher and they're your student you shouldn't have any sexual contact is a teacher student relationship sometimes You have your husband, your wife, and you have uh, a liaison with somebody else. And it causes problems and difficulties, and it's just not worth it. You get immediate pleasure, and sometimes we always think, especially guys, think we're not to get away with it. And our wife will know nothing about it. And of course, uh, Remember, who was it? The head of the CEA, I think in Iraq some time ago. What was it? He was the head of the CEA. The head of this amazing security agency couldn't get, couldn't hide it from his wife. You guys have no chance. Your wife will find out. <laughs> so it's not worth doing. So that means that, you know, we try and keep a good sexual conduct. And if you're, you know, a monk or a nun, you have no sexuality, you're on eight precepts. So, you know, you should, you know, if you feel like you need to leave because you fall in love with someone or some, then leave and just disrobe and just be dishonest and just, you know, Just one moment, just one moment, the best duration for each sitting. One moment long. So don't think about time. Just be in this present moment and stay in this present moment. Don't come out of this present moment. And that's the best duration. And if you're enjoying it, carry on. Sometimes I meditate for hours, sometimes for five minutes. It really depends what I need. Wouldn't kindness, generosity, breathing, sense of entitlement, not if it's real kindness. Real kindness is like giving. Generosity, again, it's another type of giving. Just when you see something, but you need somebody, something, then you give it to them. And the best type of kindness and generosity is giving generous, generous gifts like blind. In other words, they don't know where it came from. It's a donation or a kindness which comes, you don't want any recognition, you just give it for the sake of giving. And back in the turn, you want your name on a hall, this hall was done at all, that's buying advertising rights for your ego, I call it. But if it's got no recognition of who gave it, but people just gave this amazing donations with not wanting the name to be put up in lights. That's the best type of giving. And the entitlement is think you deserve these things. And you don't deserve them. You know, you just, you just, uh, people have the opportunity to give, but you don't demand anything back in return. And I think you all know that I raised a lot. If in my, my main residence, which was more luxurious 
than the poorest of my supporters. I take the poorest of my supporters standards and I make sure I lived a more simple accommodation than them, which is why I live in my cave. And many of you have seen my cave. It's about three meters, like a hemisphere. And that's my cave and it's very simple. And there's hardly anything in there. It's electricity. I've agreed. It has a cork floor, a mattress on the floor, but it hasn't got very much. Because I did that as you know, my, my vow to live a simple life. Otherwise, I wouldn't feel correct if I had somebody who was just living in a hovel, donating so I could live in a cave. That wouldn't be right. It wouldn't be fair. As a monk, I'm not entitled to anything except what we call the four requisites. And those four requisites are uh, living at the root of a tree, rag robes, uh, arms food, and lastly for medicines, things like urine. And the Buddha kept on reminding us of that. That's all you really need to survive as a monk. Anything more is just extra. So I'm not entitled to anything. And that means that whatever extra comes is really extra. And I usually like to give it to others rather than keep it for myself. Even today, it's a hot day, you know, I got given an ice cream. And <laughs> when I got given an ice cream, a little cone ice cream. And then there was this, uh, this woman I've known for such a long time. She has got Down syndrome. And I, I went to give it to her and she, her eyes lit up. She couldn't get an ice cream. Yeah. And then and people say, oh, no, no, it's for you, Ajahn Brahm. Oh, I kind of give it away. And then one of the other disciples, they ran downstairs, they got another ice cream. So they could give me two ice creams. So I could give one to the Down syndrome girl. She really enjoyed it. It's always much more fun giving away to others and having it for yourself. But, you know, just... Sometimes people don't allow me to do this, but somebody was smart enough to give me two ice creams. So it was okay to give one away. I'm not entitled to it, but I just, I enjoy it. It's a hot day and an ice cream was wonderful today in such a hot temperature, but I love giving it away as well. Anyway, next question. Dear Ajahn, if knowledge and skills are impermanent, does it mean that the Dharma teachings and meditation programs we've learned today will not be carried over to our next lives? Thank you. Oh no, that is not knowledge. It's not the, the names and the details which you learn, it's what's behind that. It's just you know, it's skills. I think skills is a much better word. It's just emotional wisdom. That lasts far longer because that's about your mind, not your brain. It's not facts, but just underlying all those facts. Just know how to love, how to let go, how to be peaceful, how to be still. You never forget those things nor do you forget how to breathe throughout your whole life. But you know, if you just know how to uh, spell discombobulating, you may forget that, but actually how to be kind to someone, how to smile, that you'll never forget. And that's what you can carry to your future lives if you want them, how to be peaceful, how to be happy, and how to teach beautiful things in life. you got another question, oh, you go. Evening His Emptiness, Ajahn Brahm. His Emptiness, that's what they sometimes call me. Sometimes they call uh, His Holiness, but H-O-L-Y, being, no, not holiness, like being empty inside. That's why sometimes they call me Ajahn Donut. And I like the word Ajahn Donut because a donut is round, which is, represents my shape, especially around my tummy. And donut is sweet, or well, hopefully I'm sweet, and a donut is holy, it's got a hole in the middle. So that's a very appropriate word for Ajahn Brahm, Ajahn Donut. When limiters arise, do I focus on them or continue with my breath as an object? You don't make a choice. Just let that mind decide. If limiters arise, quite naturally your mind will want to focus on them. So don't you make the choice, you let your mind decide, which usually means focusing on them. You don't stop the nimittas by keeping on your breath. You don't do anything, you're letting go now. You're just a passenger. When you're a passenger, 
you know, even uh, going on an aircraft. If you remember going on aircrafts, your passion going, you don't tell the pilot, oh, can you please, um, you know, go closer to the Himalaya mountains? I'm just passing them. You know, you're in your seat. You can't have any control at all. You're just watching through the window. So just like you're meditating, you're watching through the window of your mind. You just see what happens next. You don't try and control any, anything. So you don't so decide to focus on the limiters. You don't decide to focus on the breath. You let go and see what happens. Dear Ajahn, all my friends are intellectual, materialistic, and only talk about worldly, ambitious matters and plans. Today, Ajahn Brahmani said to associate only with the good. So what should I do about my friends? <laughs> oh, they're not that bad. They're intellectual, materialistic. If you don't associate with them, then they can't associate with the good. It means they don't associate with you. So the intellectual, materialistic, but use intellectualism, materialism, to teach them about Buddhism, or teach them about meditation. Little simple things. You're materialistic, you become much more effective if you learn how to meditate a bit. Everyone knows about mindfulness really helps you. And the intellectual evidence there is so strong. And little by little, you know, that it's almost you get a crack in their wall. But sometimes people who are materialistic or intellectual, they just, any sign of religion, and they hate it because they don't agree with it. But then when you start to give them evidence, they're intellectual, you have to be evidence-based. Give them the evidence about previous lives, reincarnation. And they may resist it at first, but after a while, the evidence is so strong, they have to accept it. And that just starts to really challenge their materialism. If you are an intellectual, you cannot be a materialist because the evidence stops that and challenges it. So little by little, if you associate with them but really know what you're talking about, then soon, basically, you can convert them to being far more kind and loving and spiritual, religious, if you like, simply because the intellect points that way. Okay, the last question. Dear Ajahn, how hard easy is it for humans to go to lower, higher planes? Are humans mostly reincarnated as human or not? In the old days, it was very difficult to get reincarnated as a human because there was not that many spaces available, like going to university in the old days. It was really, really difficult because there wasn't so many good universities. But now it's so many universities it's easier for your kids to go there. There's more spaces. The same with the human realm, there's many more spaces right now for human beings, as our human population on this world has increased enormously. So right now it's not that hard to get reborn as a human being. And if the heaven, it's very hard to get reborn in the, in the animal realms because the animal realm has just really been reduced. But in the heavenly realms, it's really up to you if you really know how to do this. When you die, you think of the beautiful things in life and all the wonderful things you've done, the joyful things, and have a nice rest up in the heaven realm if you want before you get reborn as a human being to carry on your path. But as one of the disciples was saying, you know that many people in the heavenly realms, they come down and listen to Dhamma talks. And many of them get enlightened and make progress, even as heavenly beings. It's a bit difficult in heavenly be heavenly realm because you know, there's just too much fun going on there. Why go and to listen to a Dhamma talk this evening when there's something good on the TV? Yes. It's Christmas, you can have fun and then go to a party or something. But people who are wise, they can go to a heaven realm and when there's a good Dhamma talk on somewhere, they can come and listen. And sometimes they make breakthroughs as, as heavenly beings. That's what it says in the suttas. And that's what actually happens. So don't think you have to be a human being to get progress on the path. Even the heavenly beings do. So, but if you really want to be a heavenly being, and when you're dying, you have to have a mind which is suitable to be reborn as a heavenly being. A beautiful, peaceful, kind, joyful mind then you belong in that realm. If you're a negative mind when you die, or just, uh, you know, you really feel very guilty about something you've done, very anxious about what's gonna happen next, 
Of course, that type of mind, where does that belong? That belongs in the lower realms. If you've got a lot of revenge when you die, of course, you'll never get reborn in the heavenly realms. So please learn how to forgive those negative parts of your mind and all the bad things which you have done. And focus on the good things you've done. If you haven't done many, then do some more quickly. And then when you die, you can remember the beautiful stuff about yourself. And your mind becomes so peaceful, so beautiful. And when you die, of course, you go to a heaven realm if you want. If you want to get come back straight away, you can come back here. It's really up to you. Okay. So you got extra five minutes out of me today. No extra charge. <laughs> okay. No trouble at all. I wish you a very good night's rest over in Singapore. If you're going to go out and get some supper. Uh, <laughs> maybe I know Singaporeans too much or too well. Yeah. So anyway, have a lovely evening and I'll see you tomorrow morning. Sadhu. 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 Oh, we can't go out. Ah, I can't leave. For those who are still listening, it's one seven three seven zero nine six. One seven three seven zero nine six. For tomorrow's uh, Q and A with Ajahn Brahm. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Bye, Terence. Bye, Thank Terrence. you. Bye, Angie. Bye, Bye Beijing. Bye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Suwadi. <laughs>